Well, to round out Sarah's country's opinion maker, focusing on a rethink to our native uh, tree policy here in New Zealand, uh, we're joined on our panel by a farmer from Cambridge involved in a new initiative that was launched last week. It is called Ota, um, Ota Oh my goodness, my apologies. I'm going to do that again. I absolutely just had a blind blank. Otato Nahiri. My apologies. Well, rounding out Sarah's country's opinion maker this week, focusing on our native tree policy here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, we're rounding out with our panel. Uh, we have both a farmer and a consultant who work uh, daily on around an integration between how native tree forestry and pastoral farming can work together uh, in both of the areas that they are working in. Cambridge farmer Ian Brennan is a trustee on Tane Tree Trust that has launched a new project thanks to the team at Pure Advantage called um, Otato Nahiri, meaning our forest. And it's a major investigation into the opportunities and challenges that is facing uh, our native forests. Uh, they're calling for radical change to be able to meet the Climate Change Commission's targets of 300,000 hectares of new native forest by 2035. Also on the panel is environmental consultant from the agribusiness group Sam Mander who works closely with farming clients on projects to develop sustainable land use options, uh, has a farm environment planning uh, auditor uh, certification working also in carbon farming and uh, greenhouse gas management. Uh, thank you so much to both Ian and Sam for taking the time to join us on the panel. Um, Sam, B, I'll, I'll kick off with yourself before we understand more around the Tane Tree Trust and the work that o T um, Tato Nahiri is doing with Ian. Sam, could you outline a little bit about what your day-to-day -day job is involved with New Zealand farmers around the country? Sure thing. No, thanks, Sarah. It's good to be on your show. Hey, so in the, the carbon farming and forestry stuff, um, the work that we're doing has mainly been specifically with hill country farmers um, that are wanting to understand the opportunities with carbon, which is only in forestry at the moment with the emissions trading scheme. So, yeah, typically we would we would go on farm and assess firstly what are the the options and the opportunities that they have as present, which is typically with like regenerating natives um, or other exotic forestry that they've planted. Um, and then from there, we would do more of the land use assessment in terms of what are the potential um, options going forward with with carbon forestry and how they can integrate that into their farm plan. So it's sort of like a two-step process at the moment. And Ian Brennan, tell us about your journey into uh, planting native forests within your property and the makeup uh, that you've chosen to plant in terms of species and how you, you and your wife, uh, Trisha, have gone about it. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, um, basically when I realised how much of this farm is land that's too steep for cattle, I decided that forestry was the best, or forest was the best thing to, um, to, to cover the land with. And personally, I'm really only interested in native forestry. I mean, I did consider planting pines in some of the gullies where there was a big enough block to make it a viable concern, um, you know, minimum three hectares. But... I always wanted to plant natives because I thought it would be a cool thing to do, basically. That's how I started. And so I started by every winter we would plant just what we could afford, which was usually like 1,500 to 2,000 plants. Uh, and every year we'd just we'd do the worst areas. Um, and then eventually uh, we I came upon the Tane Street Trust and I met people who taught me a heck of a lot more about the potential for natives and I started aiming towards trying to set up something a bit bigger than that here. So, you know, it's a, it's a process that's evolved as I met people who could help me along the way. Tell us a little bit more about the Tane Tree Trust and Otato Nahiri, our forest, which uh, is being, you know, supported by uh, our largest philanthropist, uh, uh, Sir uh, Stephen Tindall, and Pure Advantage. How did you become more involved in this initiative that was launched last Thursday? Okay. Well, my understanding is that it's a, it's an initiative launched by Pure Advantage, of which Tani Street Trust are a part. Um, so I've been uh, pleasantly um, 
surprised and um, enlightened by reading a lot of the articles that are on the, the Peer Advantage website from people that I've only vaguely been aware of up until now. As for my personal involvement, um, as a trustee of Tane's Tree Trust, uh, I guess we're all in the um, position of being asked to speak um, at some point, um, but it's a charitable trust. It's not, you know, it's not a corporation, so no one person can really say they're speaking for the trust. In my, in my case, I always feel like I'm just giving my opinion, and um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not trying to put out a disclaimer here. I'm just trying to clarify the situation. Um, pure advantage. We're making a video on uh, on Tani Street Trust to highlight the work that we do, and it happened that they based it at our AGM, which was held on our farm. And as these sorts of interviews and documentaries go, you film, you interview a lot of people, and then back in the studio in post-production, you put it together by weaving a story out of the snippets that you've got. And they decided to make me and my farm the thread of the story. Um, so that's how I got involved in it. Fantastic. Is that- uh, th- thank you so much. And uh, Otato Nahiri is uh, the uh, short film and documentary that will be hosted on TVNZ's On Demand. You can go and check that out. Sam, it's it's a huge goal to plant 300,000 hectares of new native forest by 2035 across New Zealand. Uh, the Climate Change Commission has report has also suggested there's 740,000 hectares of gullies that could be planted in native forest. Uh, what what do you believe would need to be done to help incentivise more landowners to be able to shut off uh, some of these areas that wouldn't be so good for exotic plant plantations? Sure. Um, look, I think we're going to need to see um, more support for you know for farmers in that instance, um, particularly with funding and stuff. I mean, I know the. The way it's set up at the moment with the emissions trading scheme and what was one billion trees and stuff, there was um, a lot of option there for exotic, but to make it work with particularly new native planting, um, it was quite hard to meet costs. So incentivising, yeah, definitely with with more funding and support, education for farmers um, for particularly, yeah, new native planting. But a lot of those areas are also... Um, at the regenerating stage where there's the natural seed source and currently that's where there's really good opportunity I think for farmers because there's, you don't have the initial um, capital cost of getting the natives going so it would, it would also be good to have some recognition around those areas and, and how we can um, further establishment. Mm. Ian, what are some of the amazing biodiversity outcomes that you've seen on your property from planting uh, nearly a third of your property in native trees? Uh, just working about the farm day to day, there really isn't anywhere now that I don't see birds flying from one place to another across, you know, wherever I'm working. Um, there's uh, just having um, small blocks of bush everywhere, one sort of planting or another. Um, I get clouds of small birds, plus obviously tui, bellbirds, um, kiru, uh, city on kaka. Um, I saw a falcon the other day. Um, we didn't see that when we came here because there was nowhere for them to land or forage or just no reason for them to be there, really. Mm. And, and Sam, how do you believe uh, the biodiversity outcomes can actually start to be accounted for in a wider holistic approach as opposed to just a straight rewarding of carbon credits um, that has been to date? Yeah, so I think just um, for the farmer that that you know, with increasing natives, you're going to have um, the complementary benefits of, of more um, ecological values and biodiversity and stuff, which for them is going to be um, really integral uh, as individuals, but also as an industry to tell the story about how they're producing their product. And biodiversity, certainly now what we're seeing, even with policy and stuff, is going to be a big part of that in the future of farming, I think. So, yeah, I guess when you have natives more native plantings on farm and that sort of thing. You're you're gonna you're gonna have more of that uh, that value associated with with your farming entity and industry. Mm. Ian, in all your learnings, and you've been in multiple different industries, um, what would your advice be to to the government to James Shaw um, about how to get this policy right? Um, 
first thing is I, I'd like to agree with um, what, what um, Sam has said there about uh, we're going to have to concentrate or we're going to have to spend a lot of time uh, working with reversion because it's going to be too expensive to plant all the area that they're talking about. So absolutely, Tane Street Dust would agree with that and uh, and um, that's obvious once you think about it. Um, as to the way to make this happen, we need to realise quite, I think, draw a line between um, forestry for profit and native forestry and realise that they're not the same thing. Even if the native forest is being managed or set up to eventually be run as continuous cover forestry, you're talking about 80 years of just pure biodiversity value before you ever take anything back. So realising that those are two separate things and trying to find a value, a way to value native forests, such as um, something that's been suggested is, is um, biodiversity credits mm. in parallel with, with um, the emissions trading scheme and purely carbon credits, some way to recognise and pay for the values of biodiversity for farmers to help them to make that decision to go native rather than planting exotics in every place. Yeah, fantastic idea. Biodiversity credits, I really uh, like that idea. Um, Sam, would that type of thing help incentivise? Well, the thing is, it's more around the speed at which it's suggested we would need to plant um, that amount of trees. Yeah, sure. I mean, that's a great idea, having like a, a premium on native credits, that sort of thing, um, which is, you know, what forever forest companies like that are doing. But I think it's also important to address um, the other different goals that are trying to be achieved through forestry, and one of them for farmers. And, you know, the whole nation and the world is also um, sequestering carbon and climate change and meeting, you know, the Paris Accord and the targets that are set by the government and that. So it's really important to look at the biodiversity, but that has been where um, exotics have been put, have been pushed, sorry, because they are much quicker at sequestering. So um, we've also been looking at, you know, um, some of the research that the likes of Adam Forbes and Your Advantage and stuff have done, which utilises a permanent exotic forest and for the short-term solution of capturing as much carbon as we can to meet those climate change targets, but then looking at it from a long-term position using that um, forest as a nurse crop to then have natives coming through and being sort of more the net position of the forest in the long term. Mm. So I, I think that yeah, biodiversity, climate change, like there's, there's different things in the equation for farmers as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much both for joining us on uh, this Opinion Maker panel, focusing on our native tree policy here in New Zealand going forward. Um, you've brought some great insights into, firstly, how it's not uh, that straightforward. Things have to be looked at with different lenses. Uh, and the work that you're both doing uh, on farm from a practicality perspective, uh, I really appreciate all the hard work that you're doing. Uh, Ian Brennan and Sam Manda, Ian Brennan uh, from from Cambridge Farming and part of the Tane uh, Tree Trust as a trustee as well as Sam Manda from Agribusiness Group working closely with farmers on farm environment plans and carbon farming uh, into the future and looking at those different options. Now can I please give a shout out uh, to the documentary that is now on TVNZ On Demand uh, called O Tato Nahiri which means our forest uh, thanks to the work of Pure Advantage in Tane's Tree Trust. Uh, Ian features his story with his wife Trisha uh, on their property in Cambridge. It's certainly worth a watch, so please go and check that out. We have in New Zealand some of the most amazing, wonderful timber trees of the world. We suddenly discovered a lot of people were thinking about this possibility. Why not manage native forests for all of their values? What we're trying to do is find that sweet spot between, um, you know, you've got the farmers that are interested in growing grass and you've got the exotic forester that's growing trees for, for timber. We, we feel that there's a role there for natives and they can be integrated with the land uses and uh, they can actually enhance them. They don't have to be competing with them. A the light bulb went on and I thought, you know, you're spending all this money and effort turning what was productive land and you're giving it back to nature and making something sustainable for the future. You know, you're not mining the natural capital but actually regenerating it. 
continuous cover forestry. That's what I'm trying to set up here, uh, a, a forest that can be managed for a sustainable, forever supply of timber. Because it's a valuable resource, people will manage it and look after it. And part of looking after it is making sure it's healthy. What I like about Cassie's farm, it, it has the best of both worlds, you know. It has all the native bush up there, but it also is a viable farm. So when we restore a forest, we're not just planting trees and welcoming birds back. We are restoring the connection to, to enable everything that belongs there to thrive.